Okay, guys, welcome. Um, we have a few announcements. Um, this is something new we haven't done before in Meetup, uh, but I think it's useful to just let you know what are the new things that are going on and things that we would like to highlight. Um, the first one is we have two new AngularJS releases that happened in November. We have 1.2 finally and 1.2.1. One. Um, 1.2.2 is scheduled for later this week, so um, be ready for, for more releases coming out. In general, we plan to release more often. Um, now that 1.2 one, one, is out, it's going to be much easier than before. As if that was not enough, we also released Angular Dart. Um, if, if Dart's your thing, or if you're just curious, um, Angular Dart beta is ready to be checked out. This is something we use internally for building some of the Google apps, in addition to using AngularJS. Um, so 0.9 is out, as well as 0.9.1, I believe, is, is also out. Along all the coding we've done, there are, there are many documentation improvements that happened in November. Um, there is a new concepts document that walks you through all the concepts in Angular and makes that more easier to understand. Uh, Brian put together an awesome documentation on uh, directives. So if you were curious about all the, all the API choices uh, and all the things you can do with directives, there, there's a really long document describing all kinds of interesting things you can do with directives. And uh, I wrote a document on providers. So many people often ask me about what's the difference between service and factory and value and, and how this all works together. Um, there's a document now out there uh, on Docs AngularJS that answers all these questions. We also improved the overview pages for API and Guide, and we hope that this will make it easier for you to navigate through the documentation. Um, with with the, the documentation theme, there, there's also a new tutorial uh, that the Thinker IO guys put together. It's a uh, Okay. Um, it, it's a tutorial on building AngularJS applications with Firebase. So if, uh, if Firebase is something you are interested in, uh, there, this is a tutorial you could check out. There is a new book out there by, by, by um, Ari Lehner, uh, um, on AngularJS with Rails. Um, if you are a Rails developer, something we are going to talk about today uh, you can check out this this uh, very hands-on book on how to build AngularJS applications with with Rails uh, as the backend. We have some new stuff coming um, related to tooling. Uh, the Visual Studio guys um, have built some stuff into Visual Studio, and also NetBeans guys have uh, really awesome support for AngularJS in the in the latest uh, NetBeans release. Um, there is a workshop happening in San Francisco, so if, if you are in San Francisco on November 25th and you care about mobile applications and building applications with PhoneGap, then the PhoneGap meetup uh, in San Francisco is putting together a workshop. Um, you can subscribe to, through the link uh, in the slides. I'll, I'll, I'll share a link to the slides. And um, lastly, I don't have a slide here for it, but um, Pavel Kozlowski and I put together a uh, workshop on directives, on building directives for Angular and Bootstrap. Um, this is just some real-world directives and uh, components that you might want to build for, for your own applications or for your own uh, CSS. Um, this is all on, on GitHub. Uh, the link will be in, in slides that I'll share on the Meetup group. And you can just check out uh, the workshop and go through exercises we put together. Um, we have a few hiring announcements. Um, if you could come here, please. And in the future, if, if you have something like us to, to highlight um, before the meetup, please do let us know. Contact us through the meetup page, and, and we'll uh, put in a slide and uh, announce. Use this mic. Oh. Uh, hi, uh, my name is Hung Dương. Uh, I work for Inetco. Uh, we are a startup here in Palo Alto. Uh, we're building uh, an online um, advertising platform. Uh, so we have been using uh, Angular for the last few months, and we are looking for a full stack engineer. So if you're interested in, uh, please come and find me after the meetup. Uh, I'm sitting right there at that corner. Thank you.
Okay, thank you guys. On to the main presentation by Jeff. Um, Jeff, come on in. Thank you. Thanks, Igor. <clears throat> yeah, so um, where is my cursor? There we go. So my name is Jeff Dickey, Triple um, X. Um, my website is dickey.triplex. I will let you decide if it's safe to visit while you're at Google. Um, I'm going to be talking about architecture today. Um, it's my personally my favorite topic. Um, specifically, what I'm going to talk about is why we need thick clients. This is in a general sense, right? Um, I'm talking about thick clients of you know whether it's Ember, whether it's Backbone, whether it's something you roll out on your own, whether it's Angular. I think it's really the future of how we're going to build web applications. Um, so I want to talk about that in the context of how I've been writing JavaScript up until now and how I plan to architect apps and how I architect apps that I build now. Um, another thing I want to point out is this talk is really about the why, not the what, right? So I'm not going to get into too much detail about like how Angular works or like how to build Angular apps. I'm going to talk about how to structure Angular apps and how it fits into a larger code base, right? And where it really provides value. Um, I want you guys to walk out of here today with some concrete examples of why you should do this stuff. So if you're not using Angular and you want to, you can sell it to your company. So when you're using a next project, you'll have a reason to use Angular. And also, if you talk to people that are still you know, building traditional web applications, um, you'll have good arguments as to why they should move on. I work for a company called Carbon5. Um, we do agile web and mobile development for startups, mid-level companies, Fortune 500s. Uh, we've been around about 10 years, for 13 years, actually. Um, and um, I've only been there for a couple months, but um, I can definitely say that the code that we produce, coming from just working in startups for a long time, is stellar. Um, we do quick one-week one iterations, and we're really close with like the clients and the customers and figuring out really what the needs of the users are. Um, and we do TDD all the time. We pair probably 75% of the time, and we just build good code. So if that sounds like a company you'd like to work for, or that sounds like the kind of work that you'd like to have done, come talk to me. Um, we do Ruby, we do Python, we do Objective-C, we do um, a lot of Angular now. Um, we're big fans of Angular, um, and you know all the above. Um, we have an office in San Francisco, but I actually live in LA. Um, it's a picture of Santa Monica where I live and work. Um, I think Santa Monica is a beautiful place. I live living there. Um, I like to walk down along the beach just right here for, uh, during my lunch break. In LA, I also teach at a, a school called General Assembly. I teach a Ruby on Rails class a couple nights a week. Um, and I found teaching to be really um, one of the most inspiring things in my career. I've only been doing it for maybe a year, but I found that it really helps me kind of um, be able to talk about code in a better way, to be more patient with my colleagues, to pair better. Um, so I encourage if you ever get the chance to do like a Rails bridge or any kind of um, you know kids education kind of thing to get into it, because it definitely has been great for me. Uh, this is a picture of my students from last term. Um, you can see me with my, my Ruby staff back there in the back. And even though we graduated a few weeks ago, um, I still keep in close touch with a lot of these guys. And I'm actually supposed to teach tonight, um, but obviously I'm here. So my, my class is actually watching me right now. So I'm still kind of teaching them. Um, as I mentioned, uh, I'm a Ruby developer. Um, I've been using Ruby now for about four years. Um, I came from Python and before that .NET. And I really fell in love with Rails right off the bat. And I still think it's really just an amazing framework. Um, it's great because you just can build apps really easy. Um, coming from everything else, it was just amazing how quickly we were able to get stuff done. Um, the Ruby community also has real strong, traditionally has really um, embraced TDD, um, which I found to be the most effective way to build software um, in terms of building it quickly, building it well, and keeping regressions from appearing, obviously. Um, another thing is it's always been easy to deploy, especially with Heroku and things. It's becoming less true now, 
because um, everything's kind of easy to deploy, right? But that's originally why I fell in love with it. The other thing is it kind of packages everything for you. It gives you these cubby holes where you have like places to put your stuff. And I think that's really important, especially when you're learning a new framework, to know if you're doing it right. And this is something I think Angular does really well too. Right? It gives you that confidence that, oh yes, this should be in a directive. This should be in a service. Right? It, it gives you that idea. And if you're just writing JavaScript offhand, you don't have that. But the web is changing, and applications are changing. And they need to be a lot more interactive than they used to be. So as an example, um, users now expect, they don't just like, but they expect when they're on a website where some interaction can happen with other users, they get notified when that happens asynchronously. right? Um, they also expect for animations to happen when data changes. They don't want to just see this white page and then it refresh. It looks dated and old. Um, from the user side, they don't like it. And our clients are insisting more and more their applications look like this. Um, they also want to be edit things fast. I'm going to show an example of a standard classical Rails app and why it really doesn't um, provide for this kind of user experience we're looking for. Um, and just generally, they want their apps to be fast. Right. Um, and some people will disagree with me on this, but I genuinely believe that JavaScript and Rails are at, ends with, at odds with each other. Um, inside of Rails, JavaScript's pretty hard to test. There are ways to do it, um, but it's not standard, and everybody kind of does it differently. And typically, it's done through full integration testing, where you fire up a fake browser like PhantomJS, and those are flaky at best. Um, there's also no structure for JavaScript. It doesn't really tell you where you're supposed to put. It tells you where you're supposed to put all your JavaScript, but not individual pieces. And there's different ways to do it, and it's unclear which one you should use when. And they all are just kind of bad. And the Rails community noticed that um, their apps were starting to get a little slow, a little long in the tooth. So in Rails 4, that just came out, oh, I don't know, six months ago, um, they introduced this thing called TurboLinks. Um, if you guys have seen PJAX, it's similar to that. Some apps use it. GitHub uses it, for example. Um, not TurboLinks. I think they use PJAX. Um, but basically what PJAX does is it takes a whole body of an HTML document. And when you click an anchor tag or something, and you go to a new page, rather than reloading the page, it just replaces the body tag with something new. Um, which sounds great, but the reality is it causes a lot of problems, um, especially for my students. My students get really confused when they run into Turbolinks problems. So I unfortunately have to tell them to disable it um, right when they build their apps, which is kind of frustrating. And you know, then they want to know why, what is this thing, what's it do? Um, but uh, you know, it's better than running into some weird JavaScript bug later. Um, and because of this, um, admittedly, I have to say that I used to avoid JavaScript whenever possible. Um, I found it buggy. I found it to be unclean. Um, so I would rip out JavaScript sometimes if I saw it and it was not working well with me. So I'd just do standard server postbacks and at the cost of the user experience. In fact, um, so I run a meetup in LA called Code for LA, and it's a Code for America brigade down in Los Angeles. And I had this great idea. I was going to uh, use my printer to print out all the name tags, kind of like Christina did tonight with you guys, although if you Google, they have machines to do this. Um, I just have my laser print at home. And so when I tried this, um, this is what happened. Um, it gave me this accordion, and everything was ripped and torn. And I was very sad. And I had like 15 minutes to get down to the meetup and deliver these name tags, and was, had no idea what I was going to do. And I thought, geez, I've been working with computers for a long time, and this is what it is. So I thought, this, this kind of reminds me of working with JavaScript. And I thought, why? Why is working with JavaScript like this? Why do I have so much trouble? It should be simple. I understand the code. Um, why is it just not uh, working well? So I remember I had a conversation with a buddy of mine over lunch one time, and uh, he kind of told me that basically what beginners do is they tie everything to the DOM. All the data is part of the DOM and everything. So um, Angular has this great little image that uh, I'm sure one of you guys probably made up, but I, I love this thing. Um, not, not just with Angular, but I think with any JavaScript plot, um, code base, this is how beginners and intermediate structure their code. Basically, when something changes in the model, you update the DOM, and you store the data there. 
when you want to see what the data is on the client, you check the DOM, um, which is great at first, but once code gets more complex, you typically will end up in callback hell where you have to keep changing things and chaining things together. So in Angular and pretty much any MVC framework, there's a concept of data binding. So rather than say, when I do this HTTP call, I update this DOM element, you say, when I do this HTTP call, I update this model. And then that model on its own will be communicating with the view to update that. And it's asynchronous, so you don't call it directly. So as an example, if you have a table uh, it's supposed to be stored alphabetically, and you make some kind of AJAX call that's going to update or change anything in there, you have to resort that table. So if you're doing kind of the bad way of um, just uh, back against the DOM all the time, any time that you change the data, you have to remember to resort. But if you're using something more MVC, um, you don't have to. You just update the data, and some other code will update the view accordingly. Expert JavaScript developers will write their code in this way. Um, it's only the intermediates and the beginners that don't. And that's because they know how to structure their code. I think the great thing about Angular is that you don't have to be an expert. You can just use it. As long as you're using it correctly, this happens for you. Um, another thing that's changed is that uh, browsers have become a real platform. Um, you really can't use the internet without JavaScript anymore. So you can pretty much bet if somebody's coming to your site, they've got JavaScript enabled. And I think another reason why Rails specifically is so bad when it comes to JavaScript, I'll show some examples of exactly what I'm talking about, but I think they try and go for progressive enhancement. I think that trying for progressive enhancement ruins applications. But I don't think we need to worry about it anymore because we can just depend that JavaScript is there. So there's a few other reasons why you might want to have a single page app like Angular could provide. Um, number one, the architecture is really simple, right? Everything that happens with HTML happens in the client. You can keep all your CSS there. It's all structured nicely. And your server just has simple responses with JSON and returns JSON, typically. Um, just talks to a database and just does data transformations. Um, it's amazing how simple an app gets that's using Angular, the, the back end anyways. It's also really fast, right? Because you're not making full calls and regenerating all that HTML and showing it to the user again. You're just doing something simple and um, updating the page accordingly. Um, you can also architect the back end separately, which is really useful. Um, as I'm going to show, um, you could even try out different things for different components. And if you've got a big, you know, what we in the Rails community call the monorail, one app that's just one big Rails app, this is really, really challenging. Um, you also get a free API if you build it well and structured, right? So when it comes time to start on your Android app, your iPhone app, you've already got the API that you're already using with your client. You'll probably have to make a couple changes here and there, but you're good to go. Um, but I think the biggest one, and this is the most almost sinister part of the way we do web applications now, is that the state can live in the client. State is the result of most bugs in programming. If you've developed anything with functional programming, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Um, and typically, the way that we build traditional, you know, back-end serving the page web applications is we share state between the client and the server through session, right? So we keep the session active so that we know who the user is and what kind of data is associated with them. When we struggle with this sometimes, we learn tricks to avoid that, but it's difficult. And anytime you're talking about state and programming, you're in a nasty place. The reality is we have to have state because users need it. Users need state to run their applications. But we should push as much of that to the client as possible so we just deal with it there and keep it in one place and keep it simple. So one thing I want you guys to be thinking about as I talk and as I show some of these demos is what if the web came out tomorrow? What would web applications look like? And I, I really don't think they'd look anything like they do now. And I'd be curious to think, like, what would they look like? There's one thing that Rails does in particular that I think is, is insane. And so, other, so a few other web frameworks will do this too, but I think Rails is one in particular. <coughs> Rails will actually, um, by default, if you're going with standard conventions, um, it doesn't just like send JSON back to the browser. It actually sends JavaScript. And that idea, I think, is crazy, right? Like, that's analogous to 
if you had an Objective-C iPhone app, for Rails to be creating Objective-C and passing off to the app. I mean, not that it could compile it and run it anyways, but that's effectively what we're doing. And that's considered standard practice. Um, I think it's totally crazy. The other thing I want you to be thinking about is browsers are smart now, so let's architect with, architect with that in mind. So I'm going to show um, a couple demos, a couple apps that I have was working on to kind of demonstrate really what I'm talking about here. Where is my browser? There we go. All right, so what I have here is a very simple CRM. Right, so this is just standard Rails, no JavaScript whatsoever. Um, and basically the idea is you have a bunch of customers and you can add new ones and you can add existing ones. Um, and the way you edit is you click the edit button and it shows you, there's a post back to the server and this is on Heroku so it might take a second to load. But it, it's an anchor tag and basically just goes to a new page and shows you the edit for that user and you can make a change and go back to the other page. Um, three years ago, this would have been a great, fantastic little app. There's not very much code, it's easy to test, it's wrong. Um, but unfortunately, our users expect more. They would like to just be able to click and edit right in line here, right? They don't want to have to mess with that. And really, even though there's like nobody on this site, it's kind of slow. So obviously, Rails supports JavaScript, so you can do this with jQuery. And you'll see the functionality. If I want to change Sam Samson's, uh, it's, uh, it's loading here. Um, if I want to change his phone number, just click the edit button. And uh, make an edit to that. And it updates, right? No problem. As far as the user's concerned, this is great. But I want to show you guys what uh, is actually going on here. So if I do an inspect element on this edit button here, See, it's pretty standard acre tag that goes to customers 5 edit. And this is the case because of progressive enhancement. Because if JavaScript is disabled, you still want to be able to click that button and go to another page. Uh, but it also has this data remote true. And uh, basically, Rails puts some JavaScript on the page that when it sees that and you click this button, it's going to um, make an Ajax call to this route and ask for JavaScript. So if I look at the network tab, and I click on one of these edit buttons, what you'll see is a request for JavaScript. And the response is a jQuery finder that finds a TR tag and replaces the contents with this long, crazy string. And if this doesn't look totally nasty to you, it should. Because just think about what's happening here. The server is not only aware of you know, how the app is structured, what things go where, but it's also aware of the DOM and how to interact with the DOM. So if, say, you want to do some sorting, so if Sam's name is really, you know, Zach Samson, actually, that's right next to a Z, um, do Jeff Dickey, said do Zach Dickey, and he doesn't move into the right place. If I refresh the page, he does, um, but we're in this weird state where, like, Sometimes things are in one place, sometimes things are in another. And trying to make that work would be really hard with Rails because, oops, um, I'd have to have that sorting logic all over the place. If you add a new person, if you update somebody, then like what happens if two of these are up at the same time? Like there's all these different weird cases and it's just terrible. So I rebuilt this app using Angular um, and it works exactly the same. I'll refresh it so I get the new data. and. Uh, but the great thing is, because Angular supports ordering, nice way, a nice way, if I update the user, then he just goes right to where he needs to be. Um, so I show, I'll show you guys how this works. But it's very, very simple. We basically just have three files, CSS, HTML, JavaScript. The HTML has all the content, and basically, I have this ng-repeat 
So every customer in the customer's model, we sort them by their name. If the state is normal, we show the name and the phone number. Um, if it's under edit, when you're editing, it shows the form. Um, and that's all really you have inside of the, um, inside the HTML. The JavaScript is also very simple. It's 35 lines. Um, and a lot of this is just some test code I have up here. Um, and basically, I'm just doing an HTTP call to get some JSON and setting that customer's model to be the customers I got back. Um, it's all very simple. It's all very clean. And the server is also very clean. The server actually has much less code than uh, it would if the uh, standard Rails. And because there's not that much going over the wire, everything's really fast. So I think this is just a great way to architect software. Um, and for me, being somebody that does a lot of work with scale and large apps, it's nice to be able to maybe try out other solutions. Um, because the server is so simple, I was able to do this. So I wrote up a, a bunch of different apps that all respond to the same API. Um, I use this tool called RAML, um, which I encourage you to check out if you're building an API. Um, looks a little weird here, but basically you specify this uh, RAML format, it's a uh, version of YAML, and you specify what your RESTful API looks like here. And you get this nice little documentation, it tells you, you know, what the GET request does, what JSON schema it returns back, and you can even try it right here in the browser and see what the results are. It's really cool, I suggest it. But using this, I'm able to build apps in all sorts of different frameworks. So I built one with Sinatra, I built one with Rails, I built one with Node, and I built one with Scala. And if, if you're curious about this kind of stuff, and curious about the benchmarks, I encourage you to take a peek. But what I found was just standard Rails, I was able to get about 8,000 requests per minute on a one, one Heroku dyno, it's a $29 a month box, which is pretty good. Um, that's about 1,000 users concurrently, roughly. Um, doing a lot of tuning, and I certainly know how to tune Rails, I was able to squeeze out 66,000 by switching over to Sinatra and firing up a ton of unicorns. Um, if you know what unicorn is, having 20 is kind of scary. Um, using Node and not doing any tuning, I was able to get to 52,000. But using Scala and never having written Scala before, and it's worth noting that without having written any Scala, without having written anything in Play, not even knowing what Play was, Play is like a Rails clone built on Scala, I actually built that app faster than any of the other ones and did no tuning. Um, it literally took me like 20 minutes. If you don't believe me, check, check my GitHub. This stuff's all public. You can see the commits I made to get this thing working. It's nothing. And look at the concurrency. It's not only 60 millisecond time. Like, look at what Rails was. You know, it was 200 millisecond response time. With Scala, I was getting 60 and handling 84,000 requests per minute on one $29 box. I mean, this is crazy. Um, and again, I wouldn't be able to do this if it wasn't Angular and it wasn't this RESTful API that it's interacting with. And also, again, if I want to build a mobile app, I've got the API right here. So it's just a back-end developer's dream to have the client architect like this. It really is. I mean, I would love to be able to do this with a lot of apps, but when you've got all your CSS, all your HTML, and everything baked into your web framework, it's impossible to try and shift. So anyways, um, you know, building a single app, page app, is not without its problems. Um, these are kind of generally things that if we're trying to pitch using Angular to one of our clients that we run into pretty quickly. Um, they're not really that big a deal, but they're questions that people usually ask. So I want to address them. Um, one is, if you're architecting in such a way where you have a front-end app, which I'm going to show how to do, and a back-end app, um, you've got new two, two new projects. And you have to have a different workflow for both. Um, you can't depend on having this release tag that says, this is the release, and that's what it is. Um, you, if you are the kind of company that operates with a long QA process to verify that yes, this release can go out, this is going to be problematic. Um, at Carbon 5, most of our apps we can deploy several times a day if we want to um, because we have automated testing. 
in place to encounter any bugs that come up. So um, I do think that if you're planning on building an architecture like this, you need to be testing. You need to be testing both your client and your server. Um, I test all the time. It's not that hard. The Angular team is really keen on testing. the test all this stuff internally in depth, and they make sure all their stuff works with testing. Um, and that's also nice, because if something goes wrong, you know who to blame. Um, another thing that comes up a lot is initial page load performance. There's been a lot of articles on Hacker News lately talking about this. Um, Airbnb specifically has been doing a lot of work around this. And some of the big companies have had some issues with this. Um, but I was talking to Igor earlier about this. And um, for most people, this isn't really that big of a deal. Because if you're serving up just a static page, you could do it on like S3 or something. It's going to be crazy fast. I mean, you saw what the load times for Rails were just right out of the box. You know, so let's say your app takes an extra 50 milliseconds to bootstrap, but you're serving it through Rails or something slow. Like, ultimately, it's not going to matter anyways. Um, also, SEO, the other big thing. Um, the idea that uh, Google isn't going to be able to crawl your site. Well, there's, there's some solutions I'm going to show on the next slide so you can, you can fix this right away. Um, but it was uh, pointed out to me that... Uh, if you look at some of your server logs, um, a lot of times you'll find Google is crawling around with, uh, um, what was it, the uh, HTTP client? Huh? Yeah, like with a, with a real browser. So it's like running JavaScript. So it sounds like they're playing around a little bit, trying to get these things to uh, uh, read JavaScript, which, you know, they should do, right? Like, it's not just for Angular apps. Like any app that has JavaScript that bootstraps a page and doesn't necessarily load content, that's just how we're going to start architecting. So the crawlers going to need to account for that eventually. All of them will. Um, but you know, there are solutions even today if you want to have proper SEO. Um, an app called Brombone, there's a few other services like this. Basically just clones your app, runs Phantom JS on their side, reads everything. You throw a little meta tag on your site, and Google can follow that to see where to look for uh, um, the content. It's also pre-render. It's a Node plugin. So if you're serving your app through Node, you throw this on, it runs Phantom.js and can serve the app straight up without a problem. If you're using Ruby or Rails, there's Render Static. It's made by Pivotal Labs. Basically does the same thing. Just uses Selenium to read the pages and render them and shove them off. And um, kind of the recommended approach is Escape Fragment. So if you have a hash bang URL, um, and Google finds this link, it's going to request uh, an escape fragment from the root of the site. Um, it's not that hard to set up, and it offers basically a limited amount of flexibility when it comes to getting Google to crawl your site. Um, it was also pointed out to me that um, this also works with push date. So if you've been concerned that, oh, this won't work with push date, I guess it does. Um, there's a meta tag you have to enable. And I think Jeff, I don't know if he's in here, but he said he's going to hopefully write a blog post about how to use it. Um, so some good stuff coming. But if you want to know how I really feel about this whole thing, it's that marketers shouldn't dictate how we architect. Um, I think that's bad. Um, and you know, another thing that um, Rails developers especially kind of miss is uh, the tooling that we have. You know, we have some great tools that um, can do deploys for us, can minify our assets, can um, our CoffeeScript, because we Ruby developers like CoffeeScript, um, render our CSS, all that kind of stuff. Um, there's some great tools in, in JavaScript. Um, Grunt is one I'm particularly fond of. Um, I'm sure most of you probably used it in this room, but in case you haven't, um, it can do things like compile your CSS, minify your CSS in JavaScript, it can shrink your pings, it can test your front end, and it can automate deployments. It can do anything. I've, I've actually been finding to use Grunt all over the place, and it's just been a fantastic little tool. Uh, another one I want to mention is Bower. Uh, it's made by Twitter. And it's basically just a dependency management kind of tool. Um, it's sort of like uh, Ruby Gems, Brew, or Package Control and Sublime. You know, basically just um, gives you a little folder that all your assets go in. It's really simple. It's like doesn't get in your way. It just takes this Bower config and loads everything into a file that you or into a folder you just don't check in. And all of the Angular stuff is on Bower. Um, there's also a tool called Yoman, and I hate to call it a tool because the tagline is it's not a tool, it's a workflow. And it basically kind of wraps all this stuff in these templates for you, so you just like run a command and it'll build out your whole site. Um, and this is something I think is better 
shown than described. So I'll actually walk through how to um, how to do this. All right, so I'm going to make a new app. Bump this to sex up a little bit. And I'm going to use Yoman to create an Angular app here. So I just say Yo Angular, I think. And uh, it's going to say, hey, do you want to get Bootstrap? I say, yeah. Um, do you want to use a SaaS version of Bootstrap with Compass? I say, yeah. Um, and I can pick which modules I want from Angular. And boom. And basically what it's doing is it's just grabbing all the assets it needs. It's running Bower. It's setting up a pretty complex grunt config. Um, and it's setting up Node so it can run these, this front end app locally. So if I look inside this directory, you'll see a few different files. Um, you'll see the, the Bower config. So I'll actually open up Sublime here. So you can see that we've got, uh, we've got the Bower config, and that's how it's referencing all the Angular stuff. Uh, jQuery, Bootstrap, all that kind of stuff. And basically all that just goes into this Bower components folder here. And that's all it does. Um, there's also a pretty complicated grunt file. It does just a ton of stuff. Um, and one of the things it does that I'm particularly fond of, if you run grunt server, it fires up a little node app that uh, runs the server locally. Um, and it keeps all the CoffeeScript compiled. It keeps all the tests running if you update any tests. Um, and my personal favorite thing is it runs Live Reload. If you haven't seen Live Reload, I think it's one of the coolest things in the world. So basically what I'm going to do is I'm going to keep this page open. I'm going to go into the Styles folder here, go into the SAS file, and uh, I'm going to add a background color. It says background color red, and I save that. And we just wait a second or two, and it recompiles the SAS. So no more inspect elements, make some CSS change, alt tab. You just do all your CSS right there, and it works. Obviously, the same stuff works with the scripts. So if you're making some changes to the controller in Angular or something, you just save the file wherever it is, and uh, it'll just update the browser immediately. It's just a really fast, really prompt workflow. So. If you're concerned that moving to Angular is, or this kind of framework where you're just dealing with front end and nothing else is going to be losing a lot of tooling, no need to fear. This stuff's here. So, in summary, the way we build our apps is dated. At least the way I build apps, or have been building apps, is dated. Um, user experience isn't good, and to make it good, we have to write some crappy JavaScript, and we need foundation. And also, the web is ready for thick client apps. This stuff works all over the place, um, and there's no need to worry about it not working. And the small little caveats, the small little, little problems, there's easy fixes for them, and they're going to become non-issue, if they're even an issue now. Um, and also, for me, the thing I care about the most is it makes the architecture simple, right? It makes it so me as a backend developer can just be like, oh, I just take this JSON and save it in this database, grab some of this database, save it in this JSON, and maybe we can get to the point where we can get rid of guys like me and we can just use something like Firebase or Parse. But uh, in closing, one thing I want to leave you guys with is that browsers are smart now, so treat them like it. Thank you, guys.